maybe the connection with other places like uh, Kurdish territories and the, uh, rebel cities in, in Spain means for us uh, going out from the, from the isolation, the isolation which was imposed by the central government. Welcome, welcome to the new episode of Talk Real in the context of the activist campus of European Alternatives in uh, Schloss Martin in uh, the northeast of Berlin. I'm here with some of the participants to the campus, uh, starting from my left, uh, Hannah, uh, who is uh, in the communication department of the city of Madrid. Uh, Hello. Of course, <laughs> we know what's happened in Madrid. We know the, the extraordinary symbol that the new municipal movements in Spain represent, and it's really great to actually have, have your input here. Today, uh, next, Adam uh, from the United Kingdom, Scotland in particular, uh, an editor at Open Democracy, and I think the perspective just a few weeks after Brexit from Scotland is particularly interesting, actually, to have here. Uh, in front of you is Eleonora, who has just been elected a councillor in the new city government of Naples with Mayor Luigi de Magistris, and I think there is certainly a rebel city connection at this table, at this table that we should explore. And finally, Jakub from Kritika Polityczna in Poland, a journalist, analyst, uh, and I think you'll help me frame a bit also the geopolitical context, I think, that, uh, we'll try. that we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> so we said we were at the campus of uh, European alternatives, and maybe alternatives is a term that we can start from. Uh, we all know the very famous slogan, there is no alternative, uh, uttered by Margaret Thatcher. And it is true that uh, along the 1990s and early 2000s, for your average European, there were not many alternatives. There was a pretty stable economic political system. There was a convergence of center-right and center-left forces around broadly the same economic agenda, uh, whether it was called third way in the west of Europe or transition uh, in the new member states of the European Union or, or, or in Eastern Europe. Uh, today, clearly, that uh, no alternative system is in deep crisis. The, the economic and political establishment around us is, is crumbling, and we see signs of that uh, pretty much every week. There is not a single day that goes by without a crisis uh, hitting the European Union. But the risk is that we transition from a, a paradigm of there is no alternative to a paradigm of there are only very bad alternatives. Uh, if you have to put yourselves in the shoes of uh, an American voter a few months from now having to choose between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, or if you put yourself in the shoes of a, of a British voter last month having to choose between uh, David Cameron's uh, take on remaining in the European Union or Nigel Farage's take on leaving the European Union. Or even if you uh, go outside of the EU again and you look at the situation in Turkey, where a few weeks ago we were watching the news and we had to choose, well, what do we support? Uh, the regime of Erdogan or the uh, military coup of the army? And this is uh, a risk that unfortunately I see as pretty much real, that the, the crumbling of the system is actually leaving us with a situation where only two equally worst alternatives are, are on the table. Uh, to, 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 to put it very simply, a status quo establishment mentality or a nationalist right would be normally what you see in countries like France or, or, or Austria uh, increasingly being the case. So I really want to start maybe with having a bit of a mapping in the, in the countries that, uh, that we've got at the table of what's the situation uh, of this uh, polarization between bad alternatives and what is the space for the emergence of a third uh, positive alternative. And then maybe we can speak a bit about um, what to do to try and foster and, and increase that space for, uh, for a positive third space. Maybe, Adam, Adam, we start with you because Brexit just, uh, just happened a few weeks ago. Sure, so I don't know where to begin, but um, I, I suppose one of the things that I find fascinating about Britain at the moment is we can't really talk about Britain at the moment. There are you know, four different countries, if you ignore Cornwall, and the situation in each of the four is very different. And so you know, if we put Northern Ireland to one side for a moment, although only because it's so important and so complex, we probably don't have time to talk about it now. Um, you know, Wales is fascinating right now. It voted to leave the EU by more than anyone else. Uh, England has exactly the dynamic that you mentioned, Lorenzo. So you've got, you know, that very kind of clear split between what I would see as the kind of CBI arguing for Remain, ultimately narrowly losing. So that's the Confederation of British Industry, the kind of interests of most capital and then you know, versus UKIP and the nationalist right. And you know, while you know, whatever you think about Jeremy Corbyn, you know, that, you know, that is not uh, acting you know, positively in Britain at the moment as a force. You know, the left is fighting with itself in England as it does. 
Um, and then in Scotland, you've got a different situation again, where you have a sort of centre-left liberal SNP government, which is totally dominant. We've just had Scottish elections. They crushed all the op opposition once again, you know, arguing for Scotland accepting more refugees than anyone else in the UK. Arguably, you know, one of the only successful political parties in Europe doing that. And um, a significant debate about whether Scotland has another independence referendum in order to stay in the EU. And so uh, different in each bit of it and different dynamics playing out. And as a result, the UK long term, I think, falling apart. Is there something in Poland that is emerging to break? I understand now there is a very authoritarian nationalist government in, in Poland, a government that, uh, led by, by, by Kaczynski, and there is an opposition which is the traditional uh, neoliberal uh, or liberal uh, forces that have been dominating European politics over the, last, uh, over the last decades. Is there something else? Is there at least some social dynamics that, that are springing up in the country? In recent years, there is two things that happened that you have to note while thinking about third option or alternative, alternative option in, in Eastern Europe. And one of them is the way that new movements approach the cities and the municipal elections, which is mostly talked about in cases of Italy or Spain, but this is also happening elsewhere. And successful campaigns uh, based on, on the slogans of anti-corruption, green revival, making cities affordable to elderly and young married couples alike was a success in, in, in the last elections in Poland. And the second thing is uh, this third social democratic in essence platform that is called Razem, which uh, I'm not trying to endorse right now because I'm a journalist, they're a party. Uh, but still, I would find an interesting proposal in the scheme of things where you have the choice between conservative, pro-capitalist, pseudo-liberal uh, platform that lost the elections last year and openly nationalist, openly extremely conservative and only half-heartedly pro-capitalist uh, nationalist formation that we have now because the nuances between them uh, play an important role in Poland, obviously, due to historical and symbolic reasons. But in the grand scheme of things, it's basically choosing between uh, option A and option B, like in the UK referendum between Farage and Cameron. You don't have to really like any, any, any of them. Yeah, a rock and hard place. I think uh, in Spain we have a really different situation right now. As you know, uh, we are possibly heading our third elections at the national level. We don't have a government right now. Um, like an official one, um, and uh, since uh, 15 May, uh, we had like uh, two new parties. Uh, one is uh, Ciudadanos, which is uh, the right and a new right party, a really neoliberal one, and the other one is Podemos, which is uh, uh, really an heritage from the 15 May, one of the branch that uh, came from this movement. Um, but I, I could say uh, that uh, the third way, there is like a, something that smells like a third way, but not in a Sweden in a Sweden meaning. <laughs> Um, the, which, which are the, the cities. Like in the last uh, uh, elections, the local elections, uh, several big cities in Spain uh, were win by citizen platforms, not really by parties. I think in these tools we can have like um, a little fire who is starting and that we can play in this new uh, political cycle in Europe, in, the, in, southern, in southern Europe, I think. Uh, that uh, can bring something positive uh, for the next generations and also for us. I mean, Eleonora, you, you, you sit in a city council. Yes, no, while, uh, while I hear you, my first thinking is that um, I think we don't have to speak about the economic alternatives when we speak about contemporary Europe, and we also don't speak, uh, we don't have to speak about the third alternative just because we have a panorama of polyphonic voices, a polyphonic situation, and uh, maybe we have to check and uh, pay attention to every single situation and every single political context to understand what is happening at the moment in, uh, in uh, Europe. So in Naples, it's happening something totally different just because we have this um, new, no, it's not new because uh, we confirmed the, 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 the government of the first five years, which is uh, the government of the major Luigi de Magistris. But I think in this second um, phase of the 
of the of the government we are doing uh, a lot of things really interesting which connect direct uh, directly us with uh, barcelona with madrid and with i hope a lot of other different rebel cities which are in europe and maybe we don't know that they are they exist and fight against neoliberalism in their own experience and what we are doing it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, simple and it's not easy just because uh, we are trying to do a lot of act of disobedience to the austerity and to the neoliberalism uh, and we are doing it uh, by um, just maybe just one simple thing that is uh, uh, overcome the diktat of the European uh, Union, of course, and overcome the, the economic and formal citizenship. So we are trying to recognize the rights, the social rights, and the political rights to everyone just because they are residents and they live in, in the city, in, in Naples at the moment. Our biggest problem it, at the moment is that Naples is a southern city. In, in, in Italy, it's the most important uh, city in the south of Italy, and it's a really poor city. It's a city that the government wants to maintain in a state of emergency. We have uh, uh, enormous debt, which is uh, 8 million uh, euros of debt, which comes from the period of uh, uh, rubbish emergency and uh, earthquake emergencies from, from 80s. And, um, we don't have um, so we don't have an, an autonomy on the managing of our money or of our uh, resources. So the first thing for us is reclaim from the central government money because we want to be a rebel city. But to be a rebel city in a true uh, sense, we have to we have to, to 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 have the possibility to manage our money and manage our uh, autonomy. How, how do you go beyond the episodic nature of? Uh a certain constellation of virtue which, which exists. We have uh, examples of cities that are, that are implementing policies that are clearly alternative to, to, to the status quo, that are desirable, that outline a, pos a possible way out of this crisis. We have examples of uh, political parties like Razem, very small, Podemos, quite large, passing through uh, regional experiences like that of Scotland. Uh, and yet there is always a, set, a, 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 a radical in incapacity to put these experiences um, together, not in a, in, a, in a single container, not, not in a single force, uh, uh, but at least at the level of, of, of its symbolism. Uh, how can we show that there is actually uh, an alternative that is gaining ground, that is convincing, that is uh, valid, that is realistic, and that is also in power in some, in some places in, in Europe? How can, how can we make this transition also? I mean, look at the journalists from a communication point, point of view. You know? how, how can we go beyond uh, just speaking about uh, what's going on in Madrid or just speaking beyond what's going on in Naples and instead to uh, infuse uh, activists, citizens across Europe, that an alternative is possible and it is already being practiced, but perhaps it's not yet out there enough uh, mm -hmm. at the symbolic level. Mm -hmm. I think we don't yet talk about it nearly enough, certainly not in the UK. The UK is always very insular anyway, so the idea that you know, beyond a tiny group of people, people talk about what's going on in cities across the rest of Europe is quite rare. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen. And you know, I think increasingly, there has been a growth in alternative media over the last 10 years. I remember, you know, as a student, people would say, oh, you should all read indie media, and no one did. And, and, and now people, you know, it's not as big as the mainstream media, but there is an alternative media which has an audience of activists and so on. And I think using that to talk about these positive stories is very important. But I also think that, you know, as well as um, people reading about things happening afar, finding ways to embed those sorts of things sorts of policies in people's lives, even if just quite small examples is very important. You know, for me, one of the most important things that's happened in Scotland in recent years was one participatory budgeting project in Leith, which is a kind of poor sort of suburb of Edinburgh, where thousands of people now every year take part in setting their own budget, which has you know, led to a total re-understanding of tax. And tax isn't just something you pay to someone that gets spent elsewhere. It's something which people, you know, see what it's spent on, they decide what it's spent on, and it empowers them. So I suppose for me, it's not just, you know, partly media is vital in talking about these things and so on, but also I always remember that quote from Thatcher that economics is a method, but the object is to change the soul. And what we've had across Europe for the last 40 years is a neoliberal strategy, which is kind of sociological. It's kind of teaching us all the experiences of neoliberalism as though they're normal, teaching us all to become neoliberals. And I think that we need the kind of opposite sociological strategy to find ways, you know, even if they're kind of small corners to give people experiences of participating in democracy so they can see that alternatives do work and it's certainly possible. 
I think like like uh, I, I talk from my perspective from Spain uh, in Aura Madrid. With of course uh, uh, you work like uh, uh, to build up a structure within the city, uh, then build up a structure we can be national uh, with, uh, be between all the cities that uh, we want uh, within the state, and then uh, the international experience can can come because the thing is like we are really new um, in this experience, in, in using this new tool, and um, the aims uh, and the battles are huge. So we have huge battles, huge aims, uh, and uh, we have to be patient and think that we are in a way, and we are working on this way, right? But I think uh, I agree completely that we have to, um, to, to find out uh, the tools uh, necessary to, to, to share uh, Overall, we have to share our, our failures and our success because we have formulas that maybe with different national um, contests and different uh, local also particularities, uh, I'm sure we can copy each other. No, I think we have a lot of learn uh, with a, a non-right property <laughs> because, uh, because we have to share these formulas that works. Uh, we were working uh, this morning, for example, on the housing uh, rights uh, problem or also with the remunicipalization that is really um, to find uh, formulas to, to disobedience, sometimes the states that are against us or as we were before, it's not that different. The only, I think uh, the only difference is that we have a new tool, which is the institutional one, but we have several new tools, like uh, the one you were explaining, or media platforms, or a lot of things. But, um, but uh, we have to, to try to share this experience between us, but uh, I think we are in a, in a political moment, at least on Spain, that we are um, like looking to our faces in the mirror and say, what do we do? <laughs> it was, it was the, the, the right thing to do, how we are going to use it, how we are going to, to progress on that with the aims that we have uh, uh, before uh, we assault the institutions, right? I think I call for a, um, a little of uh, to be prudent about it because uh, sometimes uh, I think we are exhausting, exhausting our bodies <laughs> with, uh, with a lot of aims uh, and with a lot of uh, practical objectives and sometimes it's just not possible right now but it could be possible in a, in a second cycle, for example. And yet there is a lot of imitation effect. I mean, just to mention uh, cities and, and the situation in Poland, I was struck a few weeks ago when I interviewed two of the founders of Razem, the party that you mentioned at the beginning, and they told me that the, the idea of establishing a new political party from the grassroots came to them after going to Spain and meeting some of the people, people from Podemos and being inspired that, yes, it's possible, and going back to Poland and deciding to take this step. Uh, likewise, um, there has always been obviously a strong municipal, uh, move, strong municipal movements in, in Italy, but the experience of the conquer of power in cities like Madrid, Barcelona, and, and many more in Spain clearly has played a very heavy role in facilitating or pushing through uh, some of the developments that we have seen at a city level in, in Italy. So co correct me if, if I'm wrong, but is there a kind of virtuous, uh, not emulation effect, but, 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 a, but a virtuous um, construction of a, of, a, of a momentum that perhaps needs to be fostered? Um, would you like to go into this no, first? It's okay. um, I think you put it uh, marvellously. I, however, have to infuse a little bit of scepticism as well into that conversation, because I think that we are in the moment of a radical transition that we might not be able to name just yet. And the title of our yesterday's discussion was Shifting Baselines, because the, the enemy and the platform we were opposing for past years and decades had a name, a face, an internal logic that we called neoliberalism, and it was somehow um, comfortable to at least know uh, what, it, what it is exactly that you have to fight or oppose or counter. And while this baseline shifted, I see that the struggles that we worked so hard to unify across Europe have also disintegrated. And successes on a regional level and cooperation between movements in, let's say, Italy, Spain and Portugal across the Southern Axis um, were built upon a shared mutual experience of economic downfall in those countries. And if we are to expect something new to arise, we would have to 
accept the fact that it might not be as universal as we would like it to be. It might be also localized, contextualized on the regional uh, basis, uh, which isn't maybe a, a very straightforward conclusion in the era of uh, web double zero, digital technologies and social media. But I, I think we have to realize that still, despite, despite the fact that we long for a for universal narrative, those narratives are, are still very localized. One of the things I would like to see more, for example, is the recognition of the struggle in Ukraine in the Western Europe. Like we have all those inspirations traveling from the West to the East, but if you look for a real social struggle that was happening very recently and still needs our support and interest, this is what happened in Kiev and then to the east of Kiev and culminated in a brutal war in a country neighboring Europe. I, um, I like to say that Napol Napoli is uh, like on a, an imaginary line which could connect Barcelona, Napoli, Barcelona, Madrid, I, I mean Spain, Napoli and, um, and um, Kurdish uh, Turkey and Kurdish uh, Syria. Why I say this? Because in the last year, before the election, in Naples we had a lot of uh, different connections on one side with the classical European, um, the classic European country, which is Spain, with Barcelona and with the people which are building the new municipalism in Barcelona. And then on the other side, we learn and study democratic confederalism with the Kurdish people, Kurdish people from Turkey, which were opposing to Erdogan one year ago and now are, and <laughs> had the moment in a really hard way and with uh, Rojava, with the, spirit, with the autonomy experience in Rojava. Not only activists, but also the major, also the government of the city met this, uh, uh, this Kurdish uh, uh, activist, and we learned a lot of things from a, diff a totally different experience, and not European, and not classical European experience, but in that critic to the, in that opposition to the national state, to the connection between capitalism and national state, we learned a lot of things about the autonomy of Naples. On the other side, there was Europe, and there was the experiences of rebel cities. What happened in our imaginary and in our um, political perspective in the last year? Maybe the connection with other places like uh, Kurdish territories and the, uh, the rebel cities in, in Spain means for us uh, going out from the, from the isolation the isolation which was imposed by the central government. The idea of the um, Rancis government is uh, create uh, the idea of a strange anomaly around the Naples, something which is not uh, um, comparable with other places in the city, something which, which is uh, not easy to govern, easy to manage, but something that is unique and single, and, and just a singularity. What we are trying to do is put in connection with other experiences, not only in rebel cities, but other experience of uh, uh, opposition to the, to, the, to the European austerity, but not only. And uh, I think that this, uh, this um, needs of a network is something that at the moment, oh, I'm speaking about Naples, but it's something which is in the moment is reclaimed by the people of the city. At the moment, if you go in the popular assemblies in the suburbs of, uh, of, of Naples, there's a big opposition to the nation, to the idea of a nation from a, the typical identity linked to the nation, but there is a big need of Europe because it's like, uh, the, it's, um, it's like the, um, there's like the idea that in Europe and in the coalition and the confederation between the people which are living the same experience and maybe the same isolation, we can build something which is strong and something which is scaring for the beast, which is the ECB or the Euro, Euro, Europe or the central government, but only between this connection, the only as they are through to this connection. I mean. Maybe I just want to ask one very quick last round so that, that then we, we, we can close up. Um, on what you would think, on one item that you think would be um, important to work on to foster this kind of uh, uh, symbolic as well as practical cooperation that also Eleonora was, was mentioning. The, this feeling of uh, uh, it is not about an anomaly, it is about uh, an anomalous wave, if you like. It's uh, the possibility of a new wave uh, arriving and hitting you and transforming uh, what, what, is, what is in front of us. Um, I, I just want to tell you the story of uh, um, 
a year ago when I was in Athens during the struggle with the Troika of the government of Alexis Tsipras and Yanis Varoufakis, and Athens became a temporary capital of European democracy. Athens and the streets around Exarchia, they were filled with uh, you know, politicians, activists, uh, parliamentarians, uh, intellectuals from all over the world who had come to see or study or be part or anyhow breathe that, that spirit. Uh, and it was very enthusing and very, very exciting. And yet at the same time, it felt a little bit too much like a uh, spectacle where you're waiting for someone else to do it for you. Uh, it felt a little bit like political pornography. Uh, the rest of Europe looking at Tsipras, fighting the Troika, and hoping that Tsipras can achieve the climax of victory that, uh, that we were not uh, ready to be the fact that we were not ready to, to put up at our own, uh, in our own houses, actually. So um, what do you think is one, one area where um, we should be investing some time or some attention to try and foster better corporations or, uh, or this transformation of the anomaly into the anomalous ways? For me, speaking about my book, <laughs> as we say in Spanish, um, <laughs> I think communication is a, is one key word for sure uh, regarding all the rest of the areas, the the policy, the policy making, uh, the new participatory uh, um, formulas that we are exploring within different parts, like the, in the cities or who, or wherever. Um, but the communication is uh, one key that can help us if we confederate the communication, which is a, a strange, uh, a strange con concept. But I think it's uh, one of the first things that we we should do. Like, uh, of course, uh, mm, I think we 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 should start because it's the easiest part. But at the same time, uh, is something that symbolically makes make us stronger. Is um, is to to work on on some symbolic. Politics in the in the gist of approach uh, within the cities that can uh, uh, really uh, make the people to understand or the other way these cities to understand what the people want regarding uh, so many issues. For example, I think the refugee crisis the refugee crisis is one of, of the topic where the cities could, uh, uh, as we were talking yesterday, disobey another um, another uh, bureaucratic is instance in Europe and I think another another key part uh, of our political development as a, as, as movements uh, parties and the, the this uh, a whole uh, this a lot of formulas that we are using it right now is the um, to try uh, not to conquer uh, only the institutions that uh, already exist, and uh, of course, try to pervert them and to change them uh, from inside uh, with alliance uh, with the outside and everything, but also to create new uh, institutional levels that uh, the so-called the system, to be, <laughs> to be, sim to be simple, um, cannot identify, so they cannot be opposed, at least at the first, uh, on first instance. Uh, for example, a European Confederation of Cities, of rebel cities, or uh, whatever the name we want to, to, to give them, uh, it could be uh, one tool that could uh, speak at the same level publicly uh, and uh, to the public opinion uh, at the same level at the, at the national states completely right now. We have this ecosystem and we are not, ab we are not being able to use it. I think we, we have to keep in on build uh, social struggles and social movements because maybe the most important thing in Greece uh, it's uh, I think that that was one of the problem after the OK and after the referendum we have to we have to know that in general if we want to assault the situation it's okay and we are doing it and it's uh, and we are um, we are checking that is an effective practice it's okay but the problem is that the, the, the squares must be always full because your strength is that square full is that street full of people and is the is the real radical democracy which are people in in the streets and in the squares of people which ask for the for right to decision and not just the formal institution in itself because the formal institution is it's, it's nothing uh, compared with the big institutions and the beast which want to um, kill us, not only in a symbolic uh, uh, sense. Yes, I suppose, for me, you know, one of the things that's worth remembering is that over the course of a decade, the radical left in Europe has gone from getting quite good at organising protest camps outside international summits to taking control of 
a series of major cities in the you know across the continent and that's a difficult thing to do just as it was quite difficult to set up the protest camp at Glen Eagle in 2005 it's even harder to you know run Madrid or Barcelona or Naples or you know whatever and that just does require a lot of practical skills and for capitalist parties for neoliberal parties they have all this whole infrastructure of you know big businesses who come in and advise them on this stuff you've got you know PricewaterhouseCoopers trying to tell you how to structure your payroll and you know Okay, you know, and so on, and um, and, all, you know, and we don't have the same thing, you know. Unless you want to go to these companies, you don't have the same ability to you know, share information. So for me, just the sort of um, ability to share the kind of practical bits of running cities, which I don't know about, <laughs> but someone has to, you know. You've got to still make sure the bins work. Um, is is going to be important, and you know, the more that there's success, the more you know, the, the radical left does begin to win things. The more it's got to get, we've got to get good at like the practical business of running the state, as well as you know, in, in the face of you know the opposition of capital, which makes it even harder. Well, I think if we have to identify one thing that would be a hashtag for that, what, what, what has to be done, I would say it's breaking the bubble in every sense, in a sense that going beyond that group of already convinced and preaching to the, preaching to the choir in a sense of breaking the media bubble and in a very technical sense as well, the media bubble that we all live in as well, uh, that we don't communicate with people who might come from different backgrounds or profess different views, but also breaking the bubble of the electoral system, which in many, many countries in Europe and beyond engages the very similar groups over and over again. And from my experience and from experience of various uh, different contexts. It's easy to infer that winning a political game is also about getting some other people to join the system. Lula in Brazil it could be one positive example, and right-wing law and justice party in Poland would be another from, from a different side of the spectrum, where they prepared a mass mobilization of elderly people, a group who regularly no other party wishes to address in, in this Central Eastern European context. But this is not basically a favourite topic of the mainstream either, like elderly people and the problems, infrastructure for them, and, and so on. So I think that bubble is, is a key to broaden the horizons of activism that we all profess and all find sense in and all want to partake if this activism wants to achieve a tangible success in a hostile environment. Because let's be honest about it, environment towards progressive social movements always been harsh and it's getting even harsher in, in some extent, especially while looking to the East and what's happening there and what's cooking there. Yeah. I have to thank you uh, for, for, this, for this enlightening chat and I need to leave it there uh, to send you all back to work because ultimately we're not just talking about these issues but we're here these days also to act on them and to try and improve and foster our capacity to better respond to them. Uh, you made me think of this quote that I really like from Franz Kafka. Um, in a moment of melancholia, he wrote in his diary, uh, you know, you're reserved for a fantastic Monday, but pity that Sunday will never end. And um, I felt like that often in the past, uh, when we had all these fantastic visions of what uh, democracy could look like, the economy could look like, uh, the, how the commons could be differently managed. And yet, uh, around me, I saw a system that was extraordinarily powerful and stable that was keeping the Sunday that I, that I disliked uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly up. And, and and now I think that is no longer the case. Uh, we're now looking at a very shaky Sunday. We're looking at a system that, uh, as I think most of us have been uh, hinting at, is um, in an existential crisis. And it is that moment when the Sunday is beginning to end and Monday is beginning to, to dawn, which may not necessarily be a better day than, than Sunday. It could be a worse day. And we see some traces of that in some of the political uh, processes uh, in, in Europe these days. But at least it means that a game is open. And despite some losses and some traumas, like the Greek capitulation a year ago, it is important to remember that we are in the midst of this great transformation and we need to keep our strength, build up our strength, keep our courage, build up our courage, and really get down to work. And it's really now the time to do it. So let's go back to the campus. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.